Thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me and all of the panelists to this session. I think uh, we have to congratulate uh, Deshpande Foundation and the organizers, uh, organi organizers for consistently putting together uh, and curating this event. It's been marvelous so far and I can assure you that this session which builds on the theme of uh, uh, technology for scale and impact uh, with a focus on education and you know, debating whether education can really be an equalizer and democratize learning opportunities for youngsters. Uh, and we have, of course, a stellar uh, panel with me. And uh, I do hope that you will keep your phones inside and uh, give us full attention because it is going to be insightful. I think uh, a lot of the preamble has been already covered. Uh, EdTech has been a buzzword, um, but the pandemic has clearly uh, rekindle the discussion uh, and the importance of technology. The new education policy also takes cognizance of the fact that digital learning is here to stay. Uh, you know, the pandemic clearly saw 247 million students, young students, school students being pushed out of education and clearly revealed that the digital divide in the country is still pretty stark. Uh, what we would like to discuss here is can technology really be an equalizer? Can it really offer a level playing field to students from all communities? Or will EdTech continue to provide solutions and products for the privileged? Uh, you know, with these questions, if, if it can be an equalizer, how can it be an equalizer? And what are some of the collaborations that uh, might be needed between Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar as we talk about to bring this into action? Uh, so we'll plunge straight into the questions and I'd perhaps like to uh, ask the you know, very broad question uh, around uh, whether technology can really bridge the gap in learning between uh, the haves and the have-nots. And I'll leave it open for all of you. I'll maybe start with Kiran. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So during, it was during the 2020, when the pandemic struck, our management decided uh, because the entire education had come to a grinding halt. So then, because we have been going to the school over the last 15 years through our employees' ESR initiatives, so our management asked, is there anything which we can do at scale so that we can give equal opportunities for all the people, be it uh, in the private schools or at home, now everybody is at home. Then uh, they also gave us a target, so it should be at scale. So let's uh, target for a number of 10 million students to be impacted with 21st century digital skills by 2025. That was the goal given. So with our experience and with our experience of uh, also remote education, we went back with the proposal on how it can be done. And we were also a bit, uh, there was a bit of anxiety how this will be taken up because it is during the pandemic. But when we look back, when it was launched in 2021, March, and in the last just two years alone, we see about 5 million learners have come on board. And good number of them have come from remote places in government schools and government colleges. So that gives us a confidence, yes, this can be a leveler. And through our experience in uh, technology, we have also uh, uh, done a lot of proof of concepts in how do we ensure that with whatever devices which they have. And is there any way, if, if they have access to internet, can we do something? So we were able to succeed in that and we have got very good pockets of success story which I will share later. And also in the places where there is no internet, what is that which we can do? So we have done some pilots with uh, single board computers and we have done success but we still we have to see how it happens in larger numbers. So definitely, yes, this gives us a confidence. And when we look at even the younger students who are in middle school and high school, when they are quickly picking up this technology, and when we are teaching this technology, we are also telling them to come up with some solution to the real life problem, even in their own context. So we are re really happy and very excited to see what ideas they come up with. And the smile on their face when they see their solution starts working. So this gives us hope. And yes, it's our vision that it will definitely be a leveler. Okay. Would you like to add to that, uh, Amrish? Yeah, so um, 
I think uh, you know there's no doubt that technology is of course a great uh, enabler to uh, uh, drive scale and uh, reach. Uh, you know, however, I just want to bring a constant view to this. So when we look at tech for skilling, we're obviously looking at these are different uh, target groups. So one is the preschool, then is of course students leaving school and stuff like that. But uh, if you're looking at skilling for employability, uh, you know, I think. We need to kind of look beyond just tech as an enabler. We've also got to look and figure out that you know does it really address the outcomes that we are all driving at? Uh, uh, I think we have we still have a problem to solve because that's not really happened. And you know now with new tech like AI and VR and metaverse, maybe we'll probably be able to leapfrog on that. But you know that's a space which it really hasn't. It just it has probably done some percentage point, but has a lot more to do. Uh, again, at the workplace, uh, skilling on using tech is pretty compliant, right? I mean, for upskill, reskill, it works. You have matured learners, learners who do it because they have to do it. But it's that middle space where I still have worries. So while tech can really give us reach and uh, uh, capability, uh, but you know, I want to see how we can address outcomes. So, for example, can I use tech to ensure that they really get jobs in the program? Can I get employers on the platform? So I think those are some of the areas we want to see more tech being applied in the future. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Gudasi, uh, the new education policy is, you know, it talks about digital, right? How do you think the uh, pedagogy is in classrooms is going to change uh, with the implementation of the new education policy? How do you think, what role will technology play in the classroom? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So, amongst the technologist, I'm the end user here. So I can give you the ground stage information and the receiving as well. This pandemic has opened new avenues and it was a tough time for the educational administrators to take this education further because nothing was known so during such a time, the technologist and the technology as well came to our rescue. Then this is where everyone started looking at new avenues out of box because we had never thought of uh, technology and uh, distance learning as well as digital learning before that. And the way the technologies helped us, particularly the, all the education sectors, starting from primary to postgraduate and the PhD as well. It was wonderful. Had this technology was not there or has it's not float in, floating into this uh, education, then the, today's education would not have been the same. It would have been entirely disrupted one. So thank you all the technologists for this. Uh, coming to the news, yes, technology, and the digitalization is of the only ways now left out for the education to take it forward. And with the pace that is required for this century. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to go with the conventional teaching and learning. Then the other question that you had posed was uh, equalizing of the leveling effect. Uh, I can take the same example from uh, Naren Murtiji, the ATM. It is just like uh, ATM giving the required amount at the same time using the same thing. So here, the technology is the one which gives the same to all. It, it is not like uh, teacher-centric classrooms. Because as we know and uh, since all of us have gone through all the phases of education, all the teachers won't be of the same stature and same nature at the same level of teaching and learning. So particularly the rural side, the first generation learners, who used to depend mostly on teachers, they used to be the encyclopedia for many of us. But with the technology, it is not the case. We are getting the best and the same for everyone. This is how it is equalizing the education for all. 
So yes, technology is the only solution and the only way forward for the education no one wants. Uh, so very interesting. I think in, in terms of, uh, we, I mean, we understand the benefits of uh, technology and, you know, when we talk about digital learning with a component of self-learning, which is uh, what we're all talking about, right, LMSs. And, um, we've also seen uh, that uh, there is a direct correlation between the motivation <laughs> level of students and the outcomes that you present. You know, it's not just about how many people signed up or how many people have access. So I think the, uh, the divide is uh, often times not just because of access to device, but it's also the other 21st century skills that a child may have, which may be the ability to sort of be curious, learn, uh, you know, be self-motivated, um, and uh, you know, be able to ask questions. Uh, technology certainly gives us all that, right? It, you know, with AI, it can personalize uh, the learning uh, journey completely. It can uh, uh, provide opportunities to explore. It can, all of that. But despite that, we see a very low uh, sort of completion in terms of especially the MOOCs and all of the learning platforms. Um, what in your experience can differentiate or change this? And how do we sort of, how can technology bring motivation into uh, the student's learning journey? I would like to again ask, uh, maybe start with Kiran and then go to Amir. Sure. Yeah, this was a good question. So, what we're doing from my Springboard, Springboard experience. So, even though we have 12,000 plus courses and we keep adding more and more depending on the feedback which we are receiving from the universities and the college students which they are using it. So what we do is, one is definitely the relevance plays a key role in ensuring the student, the stickiness, the st same students come back week after week. And how do we bring the relevance is directly working with the universities. And we create a microsite for the specific, let's say if they are in fifth semester, computer science or electronics. So we create a curated course available to them in, the, uh, in, in that microsite. And only relevant courses are given to them. And of course, with options to here are the additional details if you want to go, that option also will be given. Of course, there will be recommendation by the AI engine. And we also work from the top down to bring so that there is a direct relevance to their curriculum. And they also earn credit by going through this. And each of these courses, we also have in embedded capstone projects. And there is a good. Uh, the uh, uh, support from the subject matter expert. So this is how we have ensured, yes, they, they have, there's a good content which is curated and which is gamified so that they don't get bored. And also they will also get to see who are the peers who are learning with them so that they can do cohort studies as well. And for experiential learning, this capstone uh, projects are there. And of course, we are also providing the playgrounds on the platform so that they can do hands-on. So now we are also setting up Maker's Lab so that they can also go and create things. So by ensuring this end-to-end -end support and with the subject matter support, now we also started giving internship on the platform. So we are also experimenting how do we scale it because internship when we do it, it's online. Of course, we also attach one mentor to each of the project. Each project is about uh, 10 to 12 weeks of duration. So when we do this end-to-end, -end, of course, then they see the bigger picture. And when it comes from the university itself with the accreditation from AICT and UGC, etc. So naturally, we see you now the more and more students are coming and staying until they complete because there is a reward. It's a win-win situation. So I guess intrinsic uh, motivation supplemented with external uh, motivators uh, to get continue the journey. I'm very sure. Yeah, so uh, you know, we did a few experiments on this and uh, way back in 2013 we launched a platform called BSC Varsity where uh, we actually broke down long duration skill programs into very, very small skill bites. And they were as little as, uh, you know, 8 to 10 hours, but they were focused on, let's say, one soft topic. So um, how to read a mutual fund fact sheet is a one course. Uh, so, uh, you know, and so they were broken down to such micro level that uh, risk to fee was so low that people would use this as a toolkit to come back and upgrade themselves. And we've been running it now for quite a while and now we have almost like 70 odd courses and our, uh, you know, um, um, 
uh, findings are very interesting. I, I have very little dropout on that. Uh, people don't drop out. Second is, uh, of all our programs, we do about 150 programs. Uh, this catalog actually has the highest revenue per course. Uh, because while the bite is small, the fees are not so little, but they are small in, in pocket. Uh, so I have learners who come, learn that skill, go back to the market, trade, make money, come back and learn the next skill. So, uh, you know, so this has worked. But uh, the problem is, uh, one of the advantages we've done is that we've stayed out of recorded courses. Uh, so, no matter it has taken us a while to scale it up, we've remained live and virtual. Uh, and uh, I've had a lot of pushback from business saying that record, give access, and I have been able to kind of navigate that. But as, uh, as late as a few weeks back, we've agreed that we will give recorded, but it comes with a two weeks lag. So, if you want real life learning, then you come, attend live, ask real time questions, you don't talk to a bot, but you're able to learn faster. So, that has been able to, you know, it has helped us to control the entire uh, piece of dropout. But, you know, I want to kind of uh, come back to this a little, uh, in a different way. If you look at the learning journey and the tech application, there are about five or six touch points on where it happens. You know, the first one is what I want to club as uh, device and data. Uh, so, you know, device and data pre geo was really the bottleneck for technology. So, you know, we didn't have devices in our hand. Uh, our devices were small and I remember setting up the online learning platform for Reliance in early 2000 and those days my biggest challenge was how do I take learning to a store. You know, I had just two MBPS line in a Reliance fresh store and out of that 85% was used for running the CRM and the other applications and I would get hardly any bandwidth to even download uh, a content. So, I actually put up a learning kiosk at the back store which had preloaded content people could go and learn. Uh, but post geo, you know, this problem has completely vanished. You now have very good data and thanks to uh, devices made in India, you have reasonably large devices on your hand, 5,000, 4,000, 6,000 people on which you can transmit content. So that one problem has got solved. The second box which I want to call is content and faculty, right? So pre geo, pre uh, COVID, uh, we had trainers who were very, very reluctant to take online lectures and rightly so because they were not trained but thankfully, thanks to Zoom and other things, they have finally adopted it. We now have faculty trainers who are much more comfortable. On content, unfortunately what happened was we imported the classroom model in the digital world. So the first layers of content development was PPTs with a voiceover and obviously it had no engagement so students dropped out, right? So if you start fixing a problem of a classroom in an online world, don't build engagement, then why would learners stay? Uh, and then there was no language support, you know, there was no scaffolding support. So, that if you see today, the content piece has got little improved, you can, you have toolkits available, there are a lot of ready to use uh, templates. Uh, faculties have started developing content themselves. This was not true even five years back, you know, if you go to a university or a college, Faculties were so technologically redundant, they couldn't even use a PPT app, their own voiceovers and kind of make a very simple basic e-learning course. But thankfully that has got fixed. But you know the real uh, box which I think we haven't really done much is the third one, which is using technology for focusing on outcomes. And when I say outcome, I mean stakeholder outcomes. So, you know, in this entire journey, we actually have three or four large stakeholders. One, of course, is the student, the learner. Second is, of course, the training delivery partner, the government and others. But the most important stakeholder here is the employer. And for that piece, we have actually not been able to deploy any technology at all. Now, you know, we, we actually good projects, right? You do and I do as well. And I'll tell you what are my biggest four or five problems where I think we should apply technology. First is mobilization. I just can't find the right guy to do the right course. I know they are all around in this place, but neither can I trace them on other hand, nor do they have digital footprints. I can't source them mapped to a particular target group of course I want to do. So what happens is someone who's good in jewelry design ends up learning data science and someone who should have learned markets has gone into automobile repairing. Now see what happens is for every dollar we spent on skilling someone, his interest is not there actually to do that course but he's done it because he has no skin in the game and it's funded by someone so he's gone through the process. So can we use technology to fix this? Second is this is severe bias on source on hiring people at the corporate side. So I won't name them, but one of the top private banks in our country looks at impeccable language, English, as a gate pass to get hired. I mean, I studied in a government school and I'm sure a lot of us have. Uh, if language becomes a gate pass and you expect everyone to have uh, such a great command over language, then no one would get through, right? I mean, there's a huge education required to kind of build and correct those biases. Now, 
The reason is the hiring managers uh, come from background which is probably privileged uh, and think that this is the pattern on which this is the perfect employee for my organization and hence a lot of people whom we skill get trained but are not employable because there is a gate pass which we don't know how it works and it is full of bias and it's not it's not a system that we, it gives intelligent answers right third uh, we need technology applications on the way we do assessments i mean look at the way all of us have cleared assessments are all formative assessments were all binary either you pass or you fail now skills is not about binary assessment i mean the way i look at it you train someone to repair a mobile phone he might not be the best guy to go and work for an apple showroom but he might probably be good enough to work in an Apple store here in Hooghly or in Bombay, right? But when you do a binary assessment and you mark him as fail, that guy now is skilled but doesn't have a credential to go forward. And you've clubbed everyone in that one box. So can you not use technology to stop this binary assessments and give a diagnostic report? So, you know, we are piloting this. We've launched a platform called Check My Skills where I don't give a binary assessment. I just tell them strength and weakness and I allow the recruiter to decide whether it's good for you or not. Uh, you know, and I think this is this is something which is required because you don't need to, uh, you know, for, imagine if you went to a pathology test and you did all your blood tests and end of the report said whether you're good or bad. Uh, imagine what would happen, right? Your pathology test doesn't do that. It just gives you indicators and says, these are your findings. You now go to a doctor. The doctor will then figure it out. The fourth, uh, you know, is uh, uh, the entire issue of demand aggregation. I think one of the biggest disconnect for all of us in the skill ecosystem is that when we go to the field and start skilling, I have zero visibility on what the employer wants. Uh, I want to use technology there. I want employers to start saying that this is just, I only want four information. Number of people, the place they want, what skill set and what cost. So that every rupee I spend to skill, I'm at least able to bring them on one platform. So, you know, our not-for-profit uh, does apprenticeship uh, placement. Last year we did about 40,000. I could easily do 2 million of them every year if I just had a matchmaking platform where I had employers to say this is what I want and I would then map all my training partners to ensure that this is what they train. So, you know, if in the entire technology journey, the first two boxes, we have done relatively good work in the last few years and thanks to Geo, Tech, Development, AR, we are probably making progress. But the th third box, if you go back and think, the very little work we have done and that's where we probably need more technology and that's where the tech will actually address the outcomes. And we need to kind of get away from uh, you know, the learner-centric thing and look at stakeholder outcome. Because if you do that, for example, if I'm able to show jobs to a learner at halfway stage, why would he even drop out? No one drops out if he knows there's a job at the end of the tunnel. It's because he doesn't, you know, so economically there's this, I think, uh, entire theory called the subjective utility theory, which actually says, what is the benefit I get for an outcome? The reason students drop out is because they don't see what is the outcome at the end of the tunnel. So I think, you know, I, I only hope if I get more volunteers to talk about it, but this is probably a space where I, you know, want Kiran and all your mighty strength and emphasis to build some tech in that space which will help all our stakeholders to kind of work on that space. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes uh, Yes, yes. Uh, as far as the motivation or uh, to motivate the students is concerned, the best motivator would be the teacher. Now the question arises whether all the teachers are motivating. So to move, there is now we have reached a stage where we need to motivate the teachers themselves first. Okay. So here, one part the motivation of the teachers and subsequently the students. And to motivate the teachers, we need technology because first we have to have that slight orientation of the teachers towards technology and use of technology. Because uh, since I am uh, there with the university, I know how the teachers are reluctant to use it. Because immediately that's uh, post-COVID, or at least the end of the first phase, the teachers used to just photocopy their notes and send it on the WhatsApp. So that was the first stage. Then with a lot of Persians, we, they started having their own content in the form of videos of the lectures, then they started posting on that. Okay. So, and now they are going for live virtual classes as well, when were required. So, the journey has taken place. The only thing is to loop in all the teachers into this journey. And here, the role of technologies and the technology gets in. This is one. 
then uh, again coming to the motivation part NEP can be the best source for this because in NEP the content is developed so that uh, if I have to take the higher education to start with during our undergraduation there are three years plus one year and every year because of that uh, multi entry and multi exit possibility every, the content of every year ends in the, or completes into a capsule like first they have gone into the job market the skills required for the job and the contents are the content that is required for those skills so this is how they have gone for the reverse engineering and we have prepared the content now the question arises how this content is to be made known to or how to make it reach the students so at this stage again as i said the teachers are to be trained because the mindset of the teacher is more important here to make NEP happen and of course uh, since Karnataka was the first one to implement NEP yeah we started with that and of course I don't say we have started with 100% uh, success rate there are some hiccups but still we could pass through now to motivate the students one as uh, being done by Infosys and many other uh, companies. Internship embedded programs would be the best one. Then, uh, as Ambish was telling, if the students have the guarantee of jobs, okay, then definitely the students will go to that. Because, as I said, the content of these is being framed based on the job market and if the job is guaranteed or then definitely the students will go to either the classroom or to the uh, online or the technology based learning that would be the most successful attempt okay. now the question is how to go about higher studies the motivation to higher studies that depends entirely on the teacher so the first phase training the trainers and the second phase motivating the students would be a great help and it can take our students for tomorrow thank you dr gasi that was uh, i mean that was a question that would have come to really about the how do you attract the best talent and develop talent the faculty pool i think that's a uh, uh, area where uh, we struggle as a nation so you've uh, touched upon uh, some of those. I, I'm just wondering, and you know, uh, this is this um, viral video by uh, Ayush Radha, which you've seen it uh, recently moving around on, where she says that, you know, the engineering uh, degree, uh, all you need is uh, chat GPT and some creativity. Uh, so can technology in the future really replace a teacher completely? And I'm saying especially, say, professional courses, and especially if you have um, uh, you know, a technology like chat GPT around which we've heard a lot in the morning as well. Uh, is there a time uh, that we think uh, the teacher will get redundant and uh, you will have technology, especially for some courses, uh, being self-taught largely or, you know, through technology? What are your views on this? Yeah. So this is already happening. One, uh, one is... Uh, not that we have to teach syntax in the classroom, for example, in, this is in the context of IT and ITES uh, education I am talking about. So what we do is, uh, anyway, they can do self-learn. Uh, yes, there was excellent content already in the market. Now, of course, ChatGPT might give, yes, give a right a program for a specific context. But what it cannot do, its teacher only can do, is interpretation of how this technology can be used to solve real-life problems. Now, he has to come up with the problems or encourage students to come up with the problems and solve it with respect to technologies. In that process, yeah, let them use the chat GPT, it doesn't matter. Finally, it is solving a real life problem. And that is where in the classrooms, even now, what we are doing is discussing the case studies. It's a group discussion on how the group itself will come up with a solution for a problem. It's not just about uh, writing the syntax. So in that way, yes, 
teacher's role will continue to exist because now the teachers have to be the domain experts who have industry or uh, the underground experience who will come and share what's happening in the real world and what challenges and how they can be solved using technology. So the role of the teacher may get redefined, uh, right? Amirish? Yeah, can I, can I have a little longish answer so I'm going to read it out here. Yeah? So, uh, no, technology cannot replace teachers in the classroom while it can enhance the learning experience and provide students with new ways to access information. It cannot replace the human connection, guidance and support provided by teachers. Teachers play an essential role in the education system and bring a unique combination of knowledge, skills, and experience to the classroom. Uh, you might be wondering why I'm reading it out, right? So what I did yesterday while coming, I actually ran this question on chat GPT at the airport. And this is what uh, the tech said. So you'll realize the tech itself doesn't believe that it can replace. So you know, you heard it from the horse's mouth. Yes, no, you can't. So, yeah, th so I thought while I was waiting at the airport, I thought, why don't I ask uh, the tech itself? So, uh, no, but you know, on another note, uh, way back in uh, mid 80s, uh, the science fiction author uh, Arthur Clarke, he was once asked that would uh, teachers, uh, technology replace teachers uh, in a classroom? And uh, he thought for a while and he said, if they can be, then they should be. So the ball is actually on the court of the faculties. If there are poor faculties, bad faculties who don't have the knowledge and they're in the classroom, that should for sure replace. And on a philosophical level, I think for every student, uh, the first teacher is a mother. And no matter what tech we get in, uh, robots will not be make babies ever on life, right? So for all of us, our mothers will remain the best teachers in our life, who teach us the first steps of doing everything. So I think we are still far away from doing that. Yes, what might happen is tech might enhance the entire experience, but uh, no, it won't. At least chat GPT doesn't say so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. I endorse the views of both of you. Technology cannot replace the teacher completely. Because whenever we talk about education, there is transformation, that means uh, uh, the knowledge or the information first. Then, the life, because during this course of uh, one's education, it is not only learning the information or the subject. One has to learn the life, values, then human connectivity, everything. So technology cannot do this. The first part, yes, it can do. Maybe in many cases better than a teacher. But coming to the second part, connecting the values, the, and uh, as uh, said now, interpretation of the information. This can be done only by a teacher. And uh, to make it happen, the teacher should be really good. Otherwise, a bad teacher can demotivate as well. Now the question arises, how to differentiate them? The only thing is to recruit better teacher. And of course, here also for recruitment, uh, the technology can help, but not to the complete 100%. Uh, coming to the classroom, because now the question is replacing the teacher by the technology. After mother, as said by Amrish, a good teacher can influence the student to the best. Maybe it is at the primary level, high school level, or even the higher education. So, technology can never replace the teacher in the classroom. Thank you. Absolutely. I think uh, we have to sort of differentiate knowledge from skills. Mentoring is an important part of the education and learning process and I think the ideal teacher would be a mentor, would be uh, somebody who nudges students along, uh, unleashes potential and I think uh, those will continue to be pivotal to the learning process. 
so uh, rightly said, everybody. And I just want to sort of maybe have last round of questions for everybody. Kita, I want to start with, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about adult learners here, higher education. And we know that uh, technology can be better adopted by most. What about young students? And I know that uh, Springboard um, does uh, have courses online for students from grade 6 onwards. Uh, there's also this whole, um, uh, you know, dilemma of how much technology exposure should young students get, right? And, and you know, the mental health, the, uh, the, the health perspective. Uh, and, uh, the, the, and there are a lot of parents in this debate talking about the actual experience in classroom versus technology. So what do you believe is a right blend for young students? Uh, and how much technology should really be used and how can it be used? to uh, really unleash the potential. Yeah, this is a very good question. So, I have been going to government schools and teaching the students uh, during the weekends over the last 15 years. So, and now that we have also started in larger scale, so now we have introduced STEM content for students from 6th standard to 12th standard. Especially, now we are also soon going to bring in the content with very good animations yes, in physics, chemistry and maths. So that now when, uh, and I also, to be in touch with the, with the students, I also uh, uh, take sessions every week. Then when I see, so far the students are, uh, the youngsters are using the, the games or these devices as a consumer. They are just consuming it. So that's where it is becoming addictive. So now when we flip it to give them interesting problem statement, and then now there are very interesting the platforms like Scratch, which we also natively brought on Springboard now. So we can give them real life problems. For example, one of the problems I gave it to a group of students, they are in 5th, 6th, 7th standard. Now, all of you are so privileged and listening to me in this live session. What about your friends who cannot see? So is there any way using Scratch, can you create some interface which your friends can also use? Then that suddenly opened their eyes. And then two weeks from there, they have come up with voice activated the uh, controls whether it works or not that's okay but they have attempted now uh, i could see the pride in them when they are doing it so that is the lower uh, the simplest of it then i thought uh, one, one of the student asked uh, i want to learn python so i asked him why do you want to learn python okay so then I want, he said i want to learn machine learning so then i said why not we create a project while you are learning so here is a simple model where it's an obstruction avoiding robot which you can create with a single board computer. So um, again, I just attempted whether they can do it. But two months later, a six standard student sends me a video and he has done it entirely at home that here is what I have done. Okay. So this, yeah, again I showed this use case to polytechnic students. And to my surprise, uh, the youngsters are more forthcoming in asking questions, they are curious. Whereas the polytechnic students are not asking. But when they saw the sixth standard kid doing it, then one girl did it in her college. Again, she did the same project, but this time she knew the entire, uh, how the code works, how the structure works, because again, she learned about, I went and saw her learning history, about 12 courses she has done on how this entire autonomous car works, how Arduino works. So she went in a structured way. Then I made her to come and present to her entire class. Then come next month, 30 students came forward, sir, can we also do this kind of projects? Now we started mentoring the entire batch of the computer science and electronic students. This is a government women's college in Ramnagar. And we are, now we can showcase this as a model polytechnic to the rest of Karnataka and rest of India. So this gives us confidence. Yes, once you give them a problem statement, be it young or adults, so they are, at least when they are attempting, so that's when it excites us, then they see the relevance, and suddenly we will make them as creators than just the consumers. So that's when they, 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 we can see the pride in them and when they are showcasing to us. So that's one of the ways in which we can make it uh, productive usage. You know, so, so technology for exploration and for self-development, and sort of being able to choose what you want to do. Uh, I think is what you're saying. So if that's sort of introduced in classes, I think that can really uh, help parallel learning apart from the school curriculum. Uh, that's that's great. Um, Amrish, uh, you know, 
with the BEC Institute and Varsity, of course, you know, you're offering, you spoke about all the programs and, you know, you've got experts coming and you've got university tie-ups. Um, are there any specific experiments or initiatives that have really shown great learning outcomes and how are you measuring that success? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to share a few of them. So, for example, uh, you know, during the year of COVID, uh, so we were looking at different problems and uh, uh, this was an assumption that we had in our team that with all the skilling interventions that uh, the entire ecosystem does, which is government, everyone, what happens is it uh, kind of uh, becomes a one fit for all. And uh, we were writing some test books for CBSC board and I went back and looked at the enrollment numbers and I found that a lot of our vocational courses, uh, instead of being done by people who probably need it, we have been actually done by very privileged students. Uh, so schools which are at top end of the bracket and they were. And I thought it was missing the bus completely. And it had a very perverse outcome. So what would happen is that, in, especially in North, uh, the university entrance uh, cutoffs are very high for commerce. I mean, some colleges are cut off as high as 99.5. And it's usually taken on best of five. And what happens, therefore, is that students would take a vocational course in banking and finance, so the best of five marks would get uh, moved up closer to 99 and a half. Uh, and therefore, uh, the top end school students would do it. Now, as a knee jerk, what the university did on the other side was it stopped taking vocational as a, a subject score in best of five, defeating the very purpose of introducing vocational in, in, in schools. So, uh, and we looked at it and we had almost like 30, 30 40,000 students taking exams every year. So, one of the experiments we did was how about looking at a target group which is very vulnerable of, um, you know, dropping out of the entire ecosystem and who probably need the vocational skills the most. So, I don't know how many of you know, but uh, we have, uh, if you look at our gross enrollment ratio, which is total population, total number of kids in a population set. Uh, over number of kids who are in school. Our school GR is actually very high. It's almost like 96, 97. During COVID it has dropped, but hopefully it's going to come back. And one of the reasons is the midday meal, toilets, and many other initiatives. But this entire GR in a college level drops to 26%, which means that out of every 10 child, about eight of them drop out. They don't even finish college. And they all go into the unemployment basket. Now, this is a bunch of kids who have school degrees, don't have any skills and the dropout. And the dropout primarily for four core reasons. One is health, second is socioeconomic reason the most, third is a few child marriages, and fourth academically weak. Uh, but out of this, the social economy is the maximum one. So one of the projects we did was how do you ensure this transition from school to workplace? Now the challenge was where do you find them? So we said, can we go back and look at night colleges and open universities and find this, these kind of students? So obviously someone who's top uh, class 12 won't go to a night college, right? I mean, who in a sense would go? And we kind of curated them and we put them through a skill intervention uh, in the second year and ensured that they transited to a workplace. So we got them placed. And you will not believe that uh, all of them got placed average about two and a half to three lakh rupees salaries while studying. And uh, were then funding their own education for the rest of the graduation course. And uh, most of them came from family backgrounds who were the first graduates. None of them in their family had even gone to a college. And for us, that uh, you know is a great success because you could now demonstrate that if you don't do a one fit for all, but look at more marginal use, then you can get better results. The second is uh, we uh, looked at uh, workplace job redundancy. So you know we all know that tech can replace jobs and all that stuff. Uh, and a lot of uh, women workforce actually get affected the most because. We have seen that once they lose their job, they often tend to move out of the job market and don't come back. And we've seen that in the last two, three years. So during COVID, uh, we did an intervention where we reskilled and upskilled uh, people who had either become redundant or had lost their jobs. And we kind of helped them with, the, uh, uh, with a very integrated uh, uh, skill program, almost, almost like four to 500 hours, and helped them move out. Uh, the results are very good. Most of them have got two job roles, which are now paying 20 to 30,000 more. 30% more than the last salary job. The third is, uh, you know, the entire skill uh, vocational is, um, for some strange reason, is very focused on the short term skills. Right? And that probably is also because of the way we are incentivized. Most of our donors are impatient. 
and uh, since it's not student pay model, it is usually dollar pay model, they want to see quick results and they expect that you will do a quick intervention then within a financial year also place him and also show him that look, this project works. So this obviously drives a lot of the ecosystem partners to do a short term game. So the long term plan never gets built. So we took a contrary view and said since we are going to fund it and give you a student pay model, we'll not play this short term game, we'll play a long term game. So we do vocational programs which are three year long time and we mimic their college education. So what we do is while they go to college, they start studying with us so that by the time they graduate, their first hour, first day job ready. And uh, last about 10 years, um, we've had phenomenal success. I mean, their return of investment is almost like 5x uh, on their fees. So if they pay uh, about a, a X amount of money for their two-year journey, their start salaries are almost like 5x of that. Uh, so what it does is, uh, we're not replacing a university degree, but we're saying along with the university degree, if you get a good long-term vocation course, then you can. So we have now extrapolated. So we moved now from financial markets to data science, and we are looking at areas like fraud policy. We are also looking at. So I think uh, so. Some of these experiments are interesting because you know obviously you are not doing what others are doing, but some of these are scalable. Some of these can move up the ladder. Some of these can make much more deep impact as well. Not online. That's the whole point. Sorry. It's all through the use of technology, all online. Yeah. Which is yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, Dr. Ravisi, the last question, really on the new education policy, it's very promising in terms of, you know, uh, building of 21st century skills, in terms of creating the digital infrastructure. Uh, what are, and I know Karnataka is one of the first states uh, to, be, uh, to have taken on uh, the implementation of this. Where are we on this uh, and how long do you think the entire transition is going to take in terms of the time? Yes, as you said, we have implemented, as you said, we have, we have taken up the NEP on us. Almost one year has gone, one and a half years actually. So almost it took us uh, more than six months to reorient our teachers first. Okay. So that was a huge task because ultimately the teachers are the one who has to take it forward. And uh, there was a gap in the understanding of the teachers because a lot of things, particularly in this uh, skill-oriented programs, then uh, ability enhancement courses. So they were pushed. The syllab, that means extracurricular activity, which we used to say uh, previous to NEP, now they have come in the form of curriculum. Okay. All the sports, NCC, NSS, they are part of the curriculum now. At the same time, uh, till now, NSS means weekly programs, then uh, one year uh, yearly camp. So that was confined, all the teachers were confined to that. But the question is, how NSS can help the students in life to understand what that volunteerism is, how the volunteerism can take this nationalism and the national interest. That was to be taught. And the teachers were to be reoriented for that. And as I said, that took us almost the next two to three months. Okay. Thereafter, at the end of the first year, yes, uh, almost 60 to 70 percent of the teachers are ready with NEP content and the understanding of NEP. Now the question is when it has to penetrate down to the students. As I said, the first six months teachers were not that ready. So naturally students had two hiccups there. Then at the end of the first year, teachers as well as students are ready. Then in the third semester, that means the first half of the second year, teachers as well as the students, now they are thinking of uh, and understanding the importance of NEP and they are going with that. So towards this, the, because we have to go, especially from the university side, we went to each and every college with our experts to understand, to make them understand what exactly NEP mean. Then even we went to the parents as well to show what NEP is and how it differs from the conventional education and in what way the students can be of uh, more beneficial 
with the NEP. Because uh, in case of NEP, we are having skill there, component of skill, component of nationalism, component for uh, value added courses, then Indian value systems in addition to the content, the subjects. Okay. Then particularly the concept of the provision for this multi-exit and multi-entry system, that helped us a lot so that the we could convince the students that even if you drop out at first year, you'll be getting a job corresponding to, because the content was getting completed into a capsule and they were ready for a particular type of job. Previously, it was not the case. So this way, we could convince the students and the parents so, yes, I think by the, this time, the fourth mm -hmm. semester, it would be in completion. Great. So, I think uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, a live example. It's good to hear that you know, we're almost on the verge of seeing all in elements of the NEP uh, in place. I think what we've heard is technology is going to be an enabler. There have been successful experiments where technology has been engaging. Technology has uh, worked with uh, students of all age groups and uh, has actually motivated them. So I think it's, it's a question of, I think, more uh, efforts to scale and continuing to innovate on the technologies to, to you know, fill in the gaps that exist today. Uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, you know, we already, I know there's lunch waiting outside. Everyone looks hungry. But we'll quickly take uh, maybe a couple of questions. Please uh, address it to any, uh, anybody in the panel that you'd like to. Uh, such a wonderful session. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. Uh, my name is Maya. I'm from Sukarma Foundation, also work in education. My question is, um, uh, people who are sitting here in the uh, conference hall, we are almost second or third generation people because we migrated from village and tribal areas and so on. Uh, the technology is, uh, you know, good when we talk about like uh, the, the electricity and internet reach there, but uh, still like most uh, most of the kids, they are not getting um, uh, cl online classes in the villages. And most important, like the government school, uh, I'm from Madhya Pradesh, so government schools are the backbone of the country where all the kids can study at least the foundation level, which is primary. And in my state, I can see most of the government school, primary level, they are demolishing or maybe in a bad condition. Because once they uh, can go to government school primary level, they won't, then only they can go to the another classes or so on. But first of the, the first problem, basically we are facing or seeing uh, that government school is, is really not functioning well. So what is your take? Because we all, the village people, we all pay tax, right? And the tax is like 18% GST and state GST and central GST and which eventually uh, should come to us in terms of education or good health care and infrastructure and electricity. And I can see most of the villages are not privileged with all these uh, facilities. So what is anybody can answer? This is my really worried uh, to modern India now. Uh, thank you. It's a very good question because this question was, being, was asked many times by many people. Uh, one thing is sure, we will never get a day where we are completely ready. We will never get a, that day in one's life. So somewhere we have to start and we have started. That's the first thing. Second thing is coming to the technology that is required and that is not available in some part of the state or some part of the country. Now here we have to pitch in the government and the technologies the philanthropists. Okay. Here, there are many philanthropists and uh, through their, uh, even the industrialists, through their CSR, they have helped many of the schools, particularly in Karnataka, and of course, uh, around this, maybe through uh, different CSR, let me not name one or two here. So they can come and help the schools to the best of their ability, and they have done it. We should be thankful to all those uh, companies and the industries through CSR. They have developed many such schools. So if the government can reorient itself 
and it's with respect to its priority okay then definitely uh, getting this infrastructure ready is not should not be a big thing because compared to or uh, looking at the importance of the uh, education to the students and the amount of money that the government would spend is nothing so that should happen and uh, karnataka is yeah, uh, far far better with respect to that and uh, if there are other uh, states i think they need to orient themselves with respect to the infrastructure that yes perfectly sir you are right so instead of putting the alumni at the front floor i talked about uh, industrialists okay so this will also include the alumni yes because uh, as madam said uh, second or third generation educated people we can go back to the schools if that particular school or the village is in need of that and definitely establish the infrastructure that can add a value at the same time it can help those students in that rural area thank you hi sir hi sir my question is uh, that can be answered by anybody in the panel uh, so i have a bit question regarding to thinking ability and uh, the way students are learning these days uh, i am an entrepreneur working with edutech startups and uh, working a lot with education field because my parents and great grand parents who are teachers and principals back then straight from british government so uh, the way they study and apply skills uh, let's say recruiting a candidate with a high graded certificates uh, is not giving me a fruitful output when i put him in the project and uh, the way the education system is going towards uh, to the next generation i um, I'm, i'm sorry but uh, i have uh, sen- i've seen education system from london because i come from london i study there uh, the way sir has told that we do classroom discussions that the same way of education has been done for me in uh, london uh, when i go and see as sir said thank you so much sir alumni plays a major role and vital role in uh, the education system as alumni if i go back and check on my university and my schools i see a lot of uh, Uh, students and uh, youngsters nowadays don't know how to apply the education they are learning and are we giving more on top of their heads or what is a bridge uh, can be bought between the students and the education sector so that we can upskill our youth and uh, instead of uh, 10% alumni making wonders in the world can it be done uh, at least 40% uh, from the alumni in the country so i think you probably trying to say the same thing what ma'am has asked so uh, i have a different view on this so yes there's been lot of uh, interventions where alumni has sponsored csr corporate government have done but i think we are pretty much missing another point is that uh, the schools will not become 100% tech enabled uh, probably for many years government has many other agendas in life you know we spoke about uh, mr murthy talked about in the morning about making someone's belly full before he can start learning Uh, making sure that their healthcare covered. So this probably doesn't even come in the top five requirements. Look at the entire education budget, education uh, uh, budget every year allocation. In fact, we're dropping our entire allocation over the last five six years. But having said that, have you heard of the Indian Institute of TikTok? No, right? But you look at the number of TikTok videos which were made. Who taught them? So the learners we are talking about of today, the millennials who were born in 2000 and now coming to the workplace, they've learned on their own. and you're missing that the schools will not have the tech it will be the device in the hand on which they will learn so the biggest advantage on geo today is that you get 2 gb of, of of data free and they will learn on their own through their own devices to their friends to the peer learning and they will experiment they will learn those skills and they'll come back so the skill ecosystem and the learning what happens the schools and colleges are thinking yes there will be a lot of money which will come in it will improve infrastructure it will improve basics it will implement computers we will be able to get digital classrooms and all that it has already happened it will continue to happen and with more csr it will probably grow 
but the actual skills will probably happen outside the learn outside the classroom called the learning outside the classroom there and we are all talking about hard skills all the softer skills will all be learned outside handling conflict how do you deal with people how do you work in a team how do you communicate these have never been taught in a classroom all of us have learned actually outside the classroom right i mean there's been obviously some efforts on this done in the classroom so you know the learning will actually be over the top through the device where the pure learning they will discover themselves they will learn they will figure out and then they will go back the second is i think this entire credential certificate system is at the fag end it will probably is the last leg of it uh, you know few years back during covid uh, i have a, a friend from iit chennai they launched an online bsc data science course uh, you know how many people applied for it uh, i think about 13 lakh and 8 lakh enrollments have happened and out of those 8 lakhs about 5 lakh students are chartered accountants doing data science course can you believe it and you know what is the entry criteria none you just clear one exam mit is running a program which is a masters in public policy and uh, uh, i think implementation of social project uh, that program uh, has no intake criteria anyone can go and enroll for the course it doesn't exit exam even if you are school dropout you can go and do and there are three faculties two of them won the nobel uh, economic award avijit banerji and yesterday and the second year for just 15 lakh rupees you can go to the campus and study so credentials and certificates will probably come in new avatar you know there will be badges like sir was saying that end of first year you can now take a certificate go to the uh, workplace so it will not be through school school will obviously have some government formative exams and some certificate but you know our learners that we are trying to address now are very different they will probably find ways to learn it and tiktok is my best example to prove that case thank you thank you so on that very very positive note we will uh, conclude this session thank you everyone it is great being here and uh, i think there's one top side uh, the organizers are in fact nudging us for a while you can always meet them over lunch and have uh, you know if you have more questions discuss them thank you very much for being here That was a brilliant session. Thanks to Shelly and Mr. Kovac. You would put it quite well. Mr. Pini and I are CEO of Fund Foundation. Each one is killing to present the members to our family.